Marty, thanks so much for joining me today and talking about this great program we're going to be doing um, all about your book and our favorite hometown baseball team, the Boston Red Sox. How long have you been a Sox fan? I've been a Sox fan all my life. Actually, um, I visited uh, Boston in 1967, the impossible dream year when I was a kid. 67, did you say? Yes. Like two? How did you visit in 67? Oh, no, no, I was uh, 10. Wow. Yeah, I'm 63 years old now, but I... You're looking I, good I, for 63, my friend. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, we have a young-looking family, and it always uh, seems to work out real well with that. But um, So I was uh, visiting Boston with my parents, and uh, my dad took me to Fenway Park. And actually, you know, I, I the difference between Fenway Park and old Cleveland Municipal Stadium, which is this which was a mausoleum back then. It was 80,000 seats and was really far away. And there was only a trickling of fans show up. And here I am. It's the Fenway Park's right off the street. And there's all this hustle and bustle and all these fans pouring in. And then I come into the, to the Fenway, to Fenway Park and see this beautiful, you know, the uh, green monster and, and, and the, the close knit kind of uh, um, family atmosphere there it was such a difference between Cleveland Municipal Stadium, but I fell in love with it immediately. And, and it was really at that time that I became a very ardent uh, Red Sox fan, along with being an, an Indians fan as well. But um, when I had an opportunity to write a book about the Red Sox, I jumped all over it when the publisher gave me that opportunity. And I, I've always been um, a huge Red Sox fan. And so your book is the ultimate Boston Red Sox time machine book. That's so correct. How did you, you know, what kind of resources did you go to, to jump back in time? How did you go and do it? Did you come and dig into the crates and dig into the bowels of Fenway Park? How did you go about your work? Yeah, well, I did. I, um, I, I used uh, a lot of online resources, obviously, um, and newspaper, old newspapers um, to, to go back. And a lot of it was from my own memory, too. Um, bases, you know, I based a lot of it on my own memory of um, Red Sox history, but I used uh, old newspaper foot, uh, articles, and I used um, a lot of online sources and, and Red Sox books. And there are um, a lot of Red Sox books. Including Burying the Curse. Yeah, that was, uh, there were a lot of those that I used as well. But uh, I wanted to get, I wanted to make sure that this encompassed the entire history of the Red Sox from well before uh, the selling of Babe Ruth in 1919. Uh, and, um, and the curse. I, I wanted to, yes, I, I, I went right from the beginning uh, um, it, from about 1901. So really this is, the book is uh, based on 120 years of Red Sox history. And it's the, uh, the greatest and most interesting and unique uh, teams and players and events um, and moments in Red Sox history. And I know that you, when we were talking about this, you actually make it a bit interactive. You have some quizzes and such to see, because I know what, I mean, there's a lot of Red Sox buffs around here, but I think that uh, you, you aim to have something to, so people can show off a little bit, but also hopefully to, to challenge some folks. I'm sure you dug up a lot of gems, uh, and you're going to have some stuff that people probably have never heard before. Uh, maybe. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be you know, imparting a lot of trivia and you know, factual information and interesting uh, facts that people maybe do not know, um, and then I, I'm going to have a lot of trivia questions. Um, I usually give about five to seven trivia questions uh, in during an event, and I, I don't want to make them so hard that nobody will know it, but I don't want to make them easy because I know there's, you know, Red Sox Nation is, is so passionate, and I know there's going to be some really knowledgeable Red Sox fans in the audience here, so I want to make it challenging, uh, yet not impossible. Yeah, that sounds like a good time. Have you ever uh, have you ever been any of the concerts or anything in Fenway Park, too? Have you... Uh... I mean, there's such you know, a lot of ball games. I a covered a lot games. of ball games there. Yeah, um, I, I covered playoffs. I covered the regu you know regular season games, and I, I, it's my favorite park to, to go to because it has so much character and so much charm. Um, and uh, it's you know it, it and it's old school. I mean, the the thing with some of these new ballparks, they're wonderful new ballparks. I've been to the ones you know Cleveland and 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 Pittsburgh and. Uh, Seattle and so forth, um, and they're wonderful new ballparks. But there's nothing that matches the old school charm of Fenway Park. And I'm hoping, uh, maybe hoping against hope, that it never gets replaced. You know, if they want to, if it gets revitalized, um, wonderful. But I, I hope Fenway Park lasts as long as it can possibly last.
Oh, it's always fun when you're down in the bowels of the park and you can see how it's grown. They have that timeline so you can see how the park has changed over time. Yeah, it's yeah well, and it has. It has. I mean, you know, obviously uh, there have been some, uh, you know, uh, modernizations at Fenway Park, but it still has, it still has the green monster and, it, you know, it still has, uh, um, you know, pesky pole and it's got, it, it's just, um, it's always going to, it's always going to be like that. And, and, you know, even in a bad year, which is rare for the Red Sox, and they're having a bad year this year. Um, hey, hey, they just had that a rough weekend, but they had three in a row there. I know through Friday night. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They're they're starting to come around. Their 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 pitching staff is just it needs uh you know with Chris Sale out and uh, Rodriguez out, and um, they're gonna you know have to rebuild that pitching staff. But um, still, you know, and and I would uh, I would assume this year if there were fans in the stands, they'd still be drawing thirty thousand people there every night. Well, I'm sure it'd be sell out every time. Yeah, you know, and and <laughs> it's it, uh, the 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 loyalty of Red Sox fans, uh, imagine having gone through, and, and fans in Cleveland know all about this too, but imagine having gone <laughs> through, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, uh, what, 90, 96 years of, um, fu- not futility, but 96 years of never having celebrated a world championship and, and having the, the loyalty involved there. How many, how many Red Sox fans went their whole life, you know, from birth to death, without having celebrated a world championship and still were passionate and, and, you know, that the Red Sox just were beloved to them. And it's just amazing. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Do you know anything? So I know that the night of this program, they're going to be actually battling. I just saw they're battling the Orioles, which as we're recording this, they're two and two in the latest series of the Orioles. Um, do you know anything? Do you have any uh, you know nuggets about the, the kind of the history between those two teams for folks that may be, you know, watching, joining us for this program and then, you know, using their DVR to, to watch the rest of the game? Well, there were a lot of periods of time, in fact, probably most periods of time. Now, the Orioles didn't come into existence until the 50s, but there were, there were a lot of periods of time where the Orioles were, were a sensational team and the Red Sox were mediocre and then the other way around. Um, the one era that I know that both teams were pretty strong were in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, but, the, you know, the Orioles had all that great pitching and the Red Sox had all that great hitting. And um, they, they, you know, they battled pretty strongly then. Um, but, um, you know, and then a little bit in the 90s too. But there were the, the times when both teams were, um, you know, lights out, uh, were, were World Series championship contenders have been fairly rare since the 1950s. Well, it certainly is exciting right now. And I'm glad that we can celebrate the Red Sox. And, and at least we're watching ball games again. I had a bunch of friends who were watching – uh, Korean baseball for a while. Yeah, uh, well, yes, the end at five in the morning. Yeah. Holy cow! <laughs> yeah, so, you got to really baseball. be a baseball fan to do that. Yeah, well, I got some serious hardcore baseball for friends that are serious hardcore fans. So they just yeah, couldn't... well, the lie there are certainly a lot of them in Red Sox Nation. I mean, all the way up from you know to Maine, you know, New Hampshire and Vermont and Rhode Island and Maine oh, and yeah. Connecticut, and then and then the millions of Red Sox fans that are scattered across the country who have. We got a fair number in New York. We won't mention the team from there, but I do know that there's a lot of big Red Sox Nation presence in New York. Even. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, you know, Red Sox fan clubs everywhere. Absolutely. In, 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 including New York. In fact, uh, when you when you attend, or you know, you attend or watch on TV a Red Sox Yankees game from Yankee Stadium. I'm sorry, I don't know that team. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's right. I mentioned. Oh, sorry, I mentioned them. <laughs> but you'll hear a smattering of applause and cheering for the Red Sox when they do something well. And right. it's, it's, uh, it's very pronounced. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and, and obviously there are a lot of uh, Red Sox fans that travel to the Big Apple, I guess we'll say it, um, to watch the Red Sox play there. Also. Absolutely. Yeah, especially in times, well, yeah, we can even do it today. So the travel restrictions are such that we can go to New York, whereas we can't go to, we, we can't stop in Rhode Island overnight, but we can go to New York. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I, I suppose I can understand that, but uh, it's it's really a strange, strange thing to watch games on television and, and see these cardboard cutout fans out there and this yeah, fake the noise, the, the, the in noise. roar of the crowd. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. I, and I, I like it. I mean, I like it better than complete silence. You know, I'm glad that they're doing that to have some kind of, you know, atmosphere, baseball atmosphere to it, but it's uh, – you know, and, and you're, you know, for a while you kind of get lost in it. Then you're thinking, oh, wait a minute, nobody's really there to make this noise. 
I think the players appreciate it too. I think it'd be really weird yes. to be playing in an empty stadium. I think it took them a while to get used to even the way they're doing it now, but I think that it, it, it made it easier for them. Yeah, I agree. Well, Marty, I'm really excited for this program. I'm really glad we can celebrate baseball. We'll be watching in the stands again. It will come. We'll get our time. Uh, we just yeah, have to stay safe. I'm looking forward to ta talking about uh, Cy Young and, and Babe Ruth before he was uh, shipped off to New York and Ted Williams and Carl Yastrzemski and Big Poppy and, um, you know, Tony Canigliaro. I got all sorts of chapters on individual players, and it's awesome. just going to be a lot of fun. I think uh, it's going to be a really fun and enlightening program. I'm sure we're going to have a blast. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate right. it.